years ago As we roll down the Sunderland Road All those waves It's stringing us along
always keeps flying. We will be gone. Thank you, 1111 Band. That was wonderful. Thanks so much. Welcome. Yes. They're not through. They're not through. We, get, we have the privilege of hearing them some more as from the other musicians uh, in, in our church. It's wonderful to be together, worshiping together as a community. As you know, we have six, seven, or eight services on Sunday morning, depending on how you count them. Uh, we're all worshiping together. Uh, at 9:30 and 11 today in uh, in the sanctuary, and it's wonderful to be together. What we're celebrating is the 90th anniversary of the groundbreaking for this facility, which happened on Tuesday, October 29th, 1929. You'll hear more, more about that in in a little bit. Uh, but we're celebrating that, and we're ce what that means is we're celebrating all those who've gone before us uh, in the faith, all those who've gone before us as part of this faith community. Uh, and their faithful uh, service. And so welcome to you all. So glad that you're here. I hope you'll enjoy the cars out front from each decade uh, and some fellowship time and some historic 
um, memorabilia that uh, you'll see in Wesley Hall across the way. Again, welcome. Time for our call to worship now. Morning is broken. We're going to sing two verses of this. Here we go. Good morning, I'm Sharm Robards. I'm the coordinator of Disciple Church. I'm also on the 1111 creative team. We stand now for the call to worship. This is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it.
Yes, yay. 90 years ago, our congregation sang that song, and here we sing it again today. Since New Testament times, Christians have found words to affirm their faith. With the passing of time and throughout cultures with different understandings and interpretations, those words have changed. Today, we are reciting what was recited by the church here 90 years ago. So read with me the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day he rose from the dead. He ascended into heaven, and he sitteth at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the work and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and life everlasting. Amen. involves the sacrament of baptism. And so we are honored this morning to invite Stacy and Wesley to come forward with Levi for his baptism. Sisters and brothers in Christ, baptism is a sign of God's mercy and love, reminding us that we do not come into relationship with God on the basis of what we do, but rather on the basis of God's gracious invitation to us. Remember the words of Jesus, how he said, let the little children come to me, do not hinder them, for to such as these belong the kingdom of God. And so I ask you now, as you stand before God in this congregation, do you affirm your faith in Christ? Yes. And do you promise to serve him as your Lord in union with the church, which Christ has opened to people of all ages, all nations, and all races? And will you nurture Levi Randall in Christ's holy church, that by your teaching and example, he may be guided to accept God's grace for himself, to profess his faith openly, and to lead a Christian life? Levi Randall, I baptize you in the name of the Father, of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Now if you'll place your hands on him also. You too, Connor. Levi Randall, the Holy Spirit work within you, that being born of water and the Spirit, you will remain a faithful disciple of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. All right, let's turn around here and see your church family. What a blessing it is to participate in this holy sacrament of baptism. We do that by pledging ourselves, along with his parents, to do all that we can 
to help nurture Levi in Christ's holy church that as he grows up among us, he'll stand at this or some other altar and make his own profession of faith in Christ. And all this is God's wonderful gift offered to us without price. Okay, extended family members, with enthusiasm, let's respond and welcome Levi Randall into this church community. With God's help, we will so order our lives after the example of Christ. That Levi Randall, surrounded by steadfast love, may be established in the faith and confirmed and strengthened in the way that leads to life eternal.
Our scripture today is taken from the book of Acts. I'll be reading from chapter 2. When Pentecost Day arrived, they were all together in one place. Suddenly, a sound from heaven, like the howling of a fierce wind, filled the entire house where they were sitting. They saw what seemed to be individual flames of fire alighting on each one of them. They were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other languages as the Spirit enabled them to speak. There were pious Jews from every nation under heaven living in Jerusalem. When they heard this sound, a crowd gathered. They were mystified because everyone heard them speaking in their own native languages. They were all surprised and bewildered. Some asked each other, what does this mean? Others jeered at them saying, they're full of wine. Peter stood with the other 11 apostles. He raised his voice and declared, Judeans and everyone living in Jerusalem, know this, listen carefully to my words. These people aren't drunk as you suspect. After all, it's only nine o'clock in the morning. Rather, this is what was spoken through the prophet Joel. In the last days, God says, I will pour out my spirit on all people. Your sons and daughters will prophesy, your young will see visions, your elders will dream dreams. Even upon my servants, men and women, I will pour out my spirit in those days, and they will all prophesy. God speaks to us through the reading of Scripture. I'd like to invite the children to come down for our time together, and kids, we're going to sit on this side. Come on. Hi, friends. Come on over. We got, oh, good. We got a whole balcony bunch. Come on over. We got room for you. Come on. Well, today we're going to have a puppet show. But I've got, if you'll go around to the other side there, but I've got some bad news. Say, Mr. Mark, what's the bad news? I forgot the puppets. <laughs> Say, Mr. Mark, who forgets the puppets? At a puppet show for children. Well, apparently I do. But I've got good news. Say, Mr. Mark, please tell us. There's good news. There is. I've got great news because I am looking at a bunch of amazing young people who have the gift of imagination. You have the ability to imagine and see things not just for what they are, but for what they can be. So you're going to help me see some of this stuff that I brought and see what it can be. So let's get started. By the way, I've got my friend Hunter here. Everybody say hi to Hunter. So let's get started. One day, there was a big forest and there was a fire. So you're going to hold that. Be, be careful. That's the hot side. All right. All right. There was a forest fire and the, the wood started to crackle and there started to be a glow. And then... A couple of clouds floated by. <laughs> and they looked down at the fire and they said, look, the forest is on fire. And they looked at each other and they said, yes, but this is not our forest. Let's see what happens. Well, the crackling started to get louder and the fire started to glow and that woke up a bird. And the bird said, Forest fire, forest fire, say that. Forest fire, forest fire. We must run to the river. And the bird flew as fast as it could to the river. Well, the sound of the bird woke up a turtle. <laughs> and the turtle said, Forest fire, forest fire. We must go to the river. And the turtle started making the long walk to the river. Well, that woke up deer. <laughs> and deer smelled the fire and got nervous and said, forest fire, forest fire. Forest fire, forest fire. 
we must go to the river. And the deer ran off, got way past turtle. And that woke up the snake. And the snake said, forest fire, forest fire. We must go to the river. And so all the animals were gathered there at the river, except for bird. And bird, they're like, where was bird? Bird was the first person to let us know that the forest was on fire. And the bird would go to the river and get a little beak full of water and then fly back up that tiny little beak of water on that humongous forest fire. And she'd fly back again and get a little bit more water and fly back. And her wings were starting to get hot and it, the smoke was starting to fill the air and drop a little bit of water. And the other animals called to her and said, little bird, what are you doing? And she said, I'm getting water to help put out the forest fire. And they said, but little bird, you're so small and it's such a big forest fire. And the little bird said, I am little. I can't do everything, but I can do something. And she got another little beak full of water and she flew and she dropped the water on the fire and tortoise who was slow to move, but she was very wise, knew that the bird was right. And she said, I am one slow tortoise. I can't do everything, but I can do something. And she slurped up a big slurp of water and made her way slowly to the fire. The deer saw that and said, oh dear, I am just one skittish deer. I cannot do everything, but I can do something. And he dipped his antlers in the river and he galloped all the way to the fire and shook his antlers just as hard as he could to try and get all those little sprinkly drops on the fire. And even the slithery snake said, I'm just a slithery snake. I can't do everything, but I can do something. And he slurped a big slurp of water and went and wiggled and wiggled and <laughs> was like a little fire hose trying to work on that fire. And the animals worked and the bird kept flying back and forth and even the tortoise made a couple of trips and the clouds looked down and they were so moved by all these little animals doing what they could that tears started to fill up in their eyes. And they looked at each other and they said, this is not our forest. We don't have to do anything, but we can do something. And they let their tears flow down like rain. And all the animals together with the clouds eventually put out the fire. And it was a long time, but eventually some little green shoots started to grow up from the charred ground where the forest fire had been. And eventually they grow into trees and to bushes and to flowers that all the animals in the forest could live in, all because one little bird who couldn't do everything, but she knew she could do something. Repeat after me. Loving God, we don't have to do everything but when we use our imaginations, we know together we can do something. And all of those somethings plus all of your somethings adds up to everything. Amen. Go back to your families. Thank you, friends. Well, as our children go back to join their families, again, we say welcome to all of you here from every worshiping community uh, that's part of our church campus. Thank you for letting us know that you've been here today by finding the registration folder that should be in every row, 
signing your name, sharing it with others. We appreciate that so very much. We're especially excited about all of our guests who are with us today. And to you, I want to say that on the back of our bulletin is a box that says, are you new? And if that relates to you, I hope that you'll look at some of the opportunities that we have every month in our church. For example, next Sunday at 1030 will be our next installment of the Discover FUMC Coffee. And we invite you to come and to be a part of that. You have a number of inserts in your bulletin today. One is very practical. It talks about things that are happening this morning, the reminder of you know, the classic cars outside, the historical items in Wesley Hall, things that you can look forward to this week, next Sunday, and in the weeks ahead. Uh, we also want to say that you've got that great historical piece uh, in your bulletin today, which references a uh, lunch that we had on Wednesday honoring people who have been members of our church for 50 years or more. You see a picture there of everybody who was in Wesley Hall for that. Um, we also have, Sharm Robarts has a lovely fan that goes back to the 60th anniversary celebration. And if there are still some, they can be found either out in the entryway, our narthex, or in Wesley Hall. If you discover some of those fans, you are welcome to take one or a handful to keep for yourself if you would like to do that. And now it is my honor and I ask you to join me in welcoming Nancy Fisher, our Director of Stewardship. Good morning. I am full of joy and thanksgiving to be with you this very special morning. I cannot think of a better day to kick off our 2020 Imagine annual stewardship campaign. Imagine those faithful beings sitting in the pews at 7th and Taylor on this Sunday morning 90 years ago. Cause for the celebration was the in imminent groundbreaking for the construction of this magnificent sanctuary. But those folks also realized that their true calling wasn't about bricks and mortar. Their God-given purpose was to live out their discipleship in action, through intentional actions, and to make sure that the way for a joyful, abundant Christian life, Christian-focused life, was available to all who entered our doors, wherever those doors were. Their financial commitment to grow their ministries and programs 90 years ago is why we are sitting in these pews today at Fifth and Henderson. We give thanks for those who had the imagination in 1929 and made it a reality. We give thanks to those who recently celebrated their 50 years of faithfulness who have also made this possible. And we give thanks today for you who will continue that vision in 2020 through your financial commitment and gifts. It's easy to imagine what Christ can do here and now through you. You are making life-changing ministries and programs possible. Children and youth experiencing God's love and amazing programs, beautiful music and pageantry and adoration of a loving God, worship, Bible studies, grace groups, giving us the tools to look at life through Christ-focused lenses, live streaming, taking our message out into the world, and then there's pickleball. <laughs> You'll soon be receiving a 2020 Imagine Stewardship Campaign Packet, which includes a letter from Dr. Brewster, our annual report, and a commitment card. Don't rush to fill out that commitment card. Spend time imagining what your faithful gifts mean for the ministries of our church. Imagine how those ministries are impacting you and those who are sitting beside you today. Imagine how your consistent gifts will make a difference to all who enter our doors in the next year, in the next 20 years, and in the next 30 years. Then respond to that calling 
by completing your commitment card. I know you will do it with a generous heart. I look forward to coming back and sharing with you in a few weeks the reality of our imaginations. Thank you. Well, we give thanks for Nancy, for all of you. And from the beginning of the Christian movement, whenever people have worshiped together, they have always taken a moment to notice others. So I invite you now to stand, turn toward others, and offer them this phrase, may the peace of Christ be with you. Would you do that, please? to invite you to remain standing while we do this next hymn. be seated. As Mike mentioned earlier, we had a luncheon this past week for everyone who joined the church through confirmation or transfer their membership or, or however they joined uh, 50 years or more ago. 
and uh, it was a wonderful uh, time, and you have a picture of those who were present at the luncheon. But I want to invite those of you who've been members of the church for 50 years or more to please stand and let us recognize you. And let me say thank you again to all of you for all that you have done and continue to do in the ministries of our church. Amen. Hello, everybody, and welcome. My name is Lance Marshall. I'm one of the pastors here at the church. I want to add my welcome to those you've already received. I normally lead the gathering worship service, which is a worship service that takes place on Sunday mornings just across the garden in Wesley Hall. And uh, I want to apologize in advance for my voice. I wish it was college football related. It's not. It was just a rapid onset allergy something. And uh, I woke up this morning and I look at my wife and I go, oh no, I sound like Barry White. <laughs> and she says, you do not sound like Barry White. <laughs> she says, you sound like Cookie Monster. So <clears throat> I want to apologize, but I just got to say, it's so wonderful seeing all these portions of our different church here. Uh, there's so many different ways that we worship and come together. It's just so great to see all of your faces together in one place today. So uh, I am normally the leader of the gathering, which is a very casual service. And it's very safe to assume that uh, a person like me who leads a casual service and preaches in jeans and who only owns half a suit, it's pretty fair to assume that I wouldn't have a really strong connection with sanctuaries or, or sacred traditional church architecture, but I have to tell you I do, and I want to tell you why that is. So those of you who have heard me speak before know I wasn't raised Christian. I, I came to Christian faith in my, my early 20s, my very early young adulthood, and I was going through a really difficult time, and I was searching for meaning and truth, and I wasn't finding it anywhere in the world, and I was beginning to find it in Jesus, in the Christian story, and yet it was still more of a head thing for me. It wasn't really a heart thing. It was just a head and intellectual thing, and so I was still really searching and I was still really hurting and I was living in Chicago at the time and even more crazily I happened to be training for some long running races and so I was out for a, a, race, a, a, a run one night. I don't remember what time of the year it was. I remember it was dark. I remember it was raining. I remember it was cold. So it was probably July and <laughs> I was out running and I stopped and I don't remember why I stopped. It was probably mile 45 of my run. and. Uh, I, I stopped and I can't remember why I stopped, if it was the rain or if I just needed a break or I also remember being really emotional in that run, a lot of things that were bothering me. I was feeling really trapped and overwhelmed by a lot of aspects of my life. And I was running from something as much as anything else and I stopped at a church. I happened to be running at that moment through a neighborhood called Ukrainian Village in Chicago. I don't want to shock you, but a lot of Ukrainians live there. And there's a lot of uh, Eastern Orthodox uh, Ukrainian and Russian churches in that neighborhood. And so I stopped in front of one of these beautiful Eastern Orthodox churches, a church just like ours, right in the heart, in the middle of the city, right there on the street. And they had this beautiful awning, portico, that came out from the front of their church. And I remember going and sitting under it. It's the dark. It's the middle of the night. I'm a young man by himself. I remember sitting down. I don't know why I sat down. I remember sitting down. I remember looking up and just like our church, they had these beautiful, intricate uh, designs and included in theirs was an icon. It's called Christ Pantocrator. You've seen it before. It's Jesus with the beautiful halo behind him and making a symbol of blessing. And I sat there, a young man by himself, doesn't even know if he's a Christian yet. Doesn't even know if he's a Christian yet. And I started to pray and I had this moment where for the very first time in my life, even though I'd been taken to churches on and off my whole life, for the first time ever, something happened back. Something real happened in my life, sitting there on the ground in front of an Eastern Orthodox church in the middle of the night somewhere in Chicago. For the first time ever, I experienced worship. For the first time ever, in that sacred space, I experienced the presence of Christ in my life. That's what sacred spaces do. That's what these set-apart places that communicate the glory and the grandeur of God do the people of that community never met me they never saw me they never talked to me I never went to one of their worship services and yet they touched me they touched me with their face because one of the things that that community did was testified to the city around them with their very architecture they created a sacred spot in the middle of the city and said God's glory and God's goodness is present here come and see and know that the Lord is good we're going to be talking over and over again about imagine and gratitude for what's happened in our church in the past and, and excitement about what's happening in the future. I just want to challenge you. 
How many people do you think this church has touched? How many people do you think this church has touched with its worship, with its service? And how many countless people do you think that this person has testified to about the greatness and the glory of God just with his presence right here in the heart of our city? First United Methodist Church of Fort Worth is a landmark monument to the presence of God then, now, and forever. And I am so thankful for it. Sacred space in the heart of the city, uh, so important. And this church has had that sacred space somewhere in the heart of our city uh, since 1853. I want to tell you stories, a story about the overall sort of sweep of the Christian story and the story of this community of faith. We heard part of that story a moment ago from the book of Acts. That's the story of the day of Pentecost. It's sometimes called the birthday of the church. It's the time when these disciples, who were the followers of Jesus, received a new preposition. Let me tell you what I mean. They had lived with the preposition with for a long time, over three years, because Jesus was with them. And they were with Jesus. And that was at the center of everything. That's, that's how they learned. That's how they went about ministering and reaching out to other people because Jesus was with them and they were with him. But that's not the case anymore. By the day of Pentecost, Jesus is not present with them anymore. And they've been struggling with that reality, wrestling with what it means to be a community. And it's on the day of Pentecost that they experience the presence of God in this powerful way, the presence of the Holy Spirit. And it's the birthday of the church because community happens and people who speak different languages hear the message in their own language and they all come together and those barriers are broken down. And, and they have a new preposition. It's not with, it's in. They begin to learn what it means to live in Christ and for Christ to be in them. And the Apostle Paul will come along later and talk about the body of Christ and will say to the community, you are the body of Christ. The presence of Christ at work in the world. And they will be challenged by that and they will strive to live into that. And we are challenged by that. And we strive to live into that. There is that phrase in the passage we heard. It's from the prophet Joel. It's about seeing visions and dreaming dreams. Your young will see visions and your elders will dream dreams. It's a beautiful passage. A reminder that, that it's dreams and it's visions that God gives that when we put them into practice, great things happen. Think about the history of this church. In the worst of times, this church has done the best of things. Founded in 1853, meeting in people's homes in small groups. For 20 years, that's how the church mainly existed. When they gathered for worship, it was in the Masonic Hall down by the courthouse. They had a pastor that came around once a quarter or so, a circuit rider. In between, laity did all the ministries of the church. It was a vibrant community, and it grew as Fort Worth grew. And then came 1873. The panic of 1873, the worst economic downturn in the history of the then still young nation. Wall Street closed for 10 days. Railroad construction stopped all over the country. It was devastating for Fort Worth. And what did this community of faith do? They bought their first property at 4th and Jones Streets. They erected the first building, a small white frame structure, and they received their first full-time pastor. Stepping out in faith. Because that's what the church does when the church is at its best always stepping forward in faith, always moving forward, always trusting, and always dreaming dreams and seeing a vision for what God has in mind for the faith community. Fast forward 14 years, and where are we? 
We're in the worst drought in Texas history, 1887. What does the church do? People are moving in droves back to the east. People moved out here to make a living. They can't make a living. The drought is devastating. It lasts over two years. It's, it's, it's a, really a nightmare for so many people. Many faith communities closed shop. What did this church do? It continued to minister to all the needs of the community, and at the same time, they moved that white frame building over, and they built a brick structure at 4th and Jones. You can still see the remnants of that structure today. There's a historical marker. In fact, did you know we take our confirmation class down to that structure uh, every year before they're confirmed to remind them of the great legacy that is ours as a community of faith that's represented in that place. Doing the best of things in the most difficult of times. Well, the church became landlocked and so they had to relocate. And they relocated and opened the new beautiful building at 7th and Taylor Street in 1908. It was March of 1908. The new faith community moved in there. The church continued to minister in so many ways. They ministered to Camp Bowie during the First World War in, with a, a variety of, of ministries. Uh, they helped to, to start some important ministries that still exist in our city today. The United Community Centers. Uh, the Union Gospel Mission, uh, the all-church home for children. Our church was instrumental in starting those. The first, did you know this? The first radio broadcast of a religious service was out of that 7th and Taylor Church in 1922 in the state of Texas. Pretty interesting. But they became landlocked again. And they had to move. They were only there a little over 20 years. Well, in fact, less than 20 years when, that, when, it, when they realized that they were landlocked again. And they had to relocate. Imagine the committee meeting discussions. <laughs> what? We just built this magnificent building. Most people are still calling it the new church. And, and we're going to relocate? Friends, that is a leap of faith. That's a bold step knowing it's not about the building. Buildings are tools for ministry. It's, it's the church doing what it needs to do to minister, to follow the dreams and to follow the vision that God has given them. And that's what they did. And so it was on October 27th, 1929, that they worshiped at 7th and Taylor on that Sunday when they were getting ready for the groundbreaking on October 29, 1929. The timing of this community of faith is impeccable, isn't it? <laughs> Here we are again on a day that the stock market would crash. A day that no one could have known on that Sunday when they gathered to worship that it was coming. And it began what came to be known as the Great Depression. Now, it would have been really easy for this church to back off the vision, to give up the dreams that God had given the church. They didn't do that. That's why we're sitting in this room today. And I could go on and on about all the ministries and the organizations and all that the church has done down through uh, the last 90 years since that day, but we don't have time for that. The Baptist will beat us to the white meat if we're not careful. <laughs> but what I want you to hear is that God gives vision and God enables us to dream dreams. And we step out in faith when we're at our best and we move forward with wherever God is calling us to go. That's who we are. That's what we celebrate today. When the church did move into this building, they locked up the building at 7th and Taylor on a Sunday morning, and they all walked over. Uh, imagine that scene. Walking over, they came into the sanctuary, they worshiped. And uh, there was, we have the worship bulletin for that service. Uh, you don't have it in your, in your bulletin. You have the one for the last service uh, before the groundbreaking. But, uh, but they came and they worshiped with 
a vision statement of sorts at the top of that bulletin. It was in the form of a prayer. And it said, God, make the doors of this house wide enough to receive all who need human love and fellowship and the care of a father. That vision, it's a God-given vision. It's one that the church has, through the decades, tried to live into for the doors to be wide enough to receive all who need human love. By the way, that's everybody. All who need human fellowship, community, that's everybody. And all who need the care of God, and that also is everybody. We've dreamed dreams. We have a vision. We move forward. The theme of our stewardship campaign, as you know, is imagine. And it's a way of talking about dreaming dreams and having vision that God gives us. Imagine what we can do as a community of faith. Imagine what it means to live out what has been handed on to us. See, those who've gone before us ran the race that was set before them to run. And, and they've handed off the baton to us. And what are we going to do? In our time, in our place, that's our responsibility, and that's the question for you and for me. Hi, my name is Bob McDermott, and I am one of the associates here and the lead pastor for the 1111 celebration, which meets across the parking lot at the, at the Center for Transforming Lives. Uh, at 1111 on Sundays. And I just have to say, I'm so impressed with my crowd, the 1111 crowd here. They are all, he they were all here before 11 o'clock. <laughs> I looked at Sharma, I said, come on, we're gonna see a bunch of people coming in here at 1112. And you're all here, I am so impressed. I get to work with people like Brad Thompson, the band, and Charm Robarts, and such creative folks. And it's such a, the, the, imagine this place. Imagine this sanctuary, but not just this, this church and all of these diverse expressions of worship and music and, and uh, just the power that comes from imagination. I want, to leave you, I want you to leave with a thought. Imagination makes the impossible real. Imagination makes the impossible real. Mark's story was a beautiful example with the little bird that conquering a fire, putting out a massive fire, it's impossible. But imagination began the spark that started something, and that ima imagination inspired others, and their imagination began to inspire others. And we had the baptism this morning, and we, and, and, and we think about this child, and I know I'm a, well, we're par my wife and our parents and now grandparents, and we imagine what our kids will be, right? We imagine their life in the future, but, but what we really do in here as we affirm together, we imagine loving him. We imagine what that would be like, and we just love, and we imagine that. That remains the thing. We can't do it all. We can't decide what everything will be, but we can imagine, and imagination makes the impossible real, just as it had for the history of this church all of those years, these 90 years now. And we now find ourselves in this really challenging time again. We find ourselves in the midst of divisiveness, and we find our church, our denomination in the midst of, of challenges, and we find our country in the midst of challenges, and our town and our city in the midst of challenges. It's life, but that's where the gospel becomes real, right? That's, that's where it's made real as we imagine who we can be in the midst of that challenge, in the midst of that darkness. I want to share a song with you. It was written by, it wasn't written by, by this guy, but he, he sort of made it famous in a new way. You, you'll know who I'm talking about when I say his name was Israel Kamakawiwiole. No, most of you know him as Is, and I'm sure I didn't even say his name right, but most of you know him as Is. He's a Hawaiian, he was a Hawaiian tenor singer and a, and a beautiful musician, a beautiful person. He had a lot of health issues, a lot of major health issues. He, his biography came out a few years ago. He passed away probably a year or so before that. I first heard Iz's song that made him really famous about 20 years ago or so. I was at a friend's place up in, up in, uh, in, out in Georgia near Atlanta, a little town called Snellville, the Snellville Methodist Church. And he was getting ready to, he's on staff there getting ready for the morning service. And I was up taking a shower. He knows how much I love the ukulele. 25 years ago, 23 years ago, it wasn't quite as significant 
significant, although back in the 20s, it was phenomenal. Everybody had a ukulele, you know, every, George Formby and, and Arthur uh, Godfrey, and, and you don't know any of these people, but they, they had, they were, it was a popular instrument and then it fell away and I heard this song being played that I'd never heard being played by a ukulele. And so years and years later, when I read Iz's biography, one of the things that everyone told Iz was that there's no way you will be a famous singer. It's just not in your cards, your, your, your appearance. You're so, it was, had such health issues. And, and, and then they said, and it's an ukulele. You can't be world famous with an ukulele, which is the Hawaiian word for jumping flea. <laughs> I dare you to go to a music store and say, say, do you have any jumping fleas? Because they do, they just don't know it. <laughs> but Iz did something amazing because he imagined something. He took one of the most melancholic longing songs in our history and paired it up with one of the most beautiful songs as a vision for the world that we have today. And he put them together, imagining the impossible real. That's where you can find me oh, somewhere over the rainbow. Bluebirds fly, and if bluebirds can fly, well, why, oh, why can't I? I see. Trees of green and red roses too. I'll watch them bloom for me and you. And I think to myself, what a wonderful world. I see skies of blue and clouds of white. The blessed day and the sacred night and I think to myself it's a wonderful world all the colors of the rainbow so pretty in the sky I can see them in the faces of all the people passing by and I see friends shaking hands and they're saying how do you do but they're really saying that I love you And I hear babies cry And I'll watch them grow And they'll learn much more than we'll ever know And I think to myself It's a wonderful world upon a star and wake up where the clouds are far behind me where 
bubble melts like lemon drops High above the chimney tops That's where you can find me Oh, somewhere over the rainbow Blue birds fly can fly well, well so can I. going to give Lance's voice a rest, and so now will you say with me the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. And now if the ushers would come forward. It is time now for us to share our finances with this church. We're remembering that we're trying to finish strong here in 2020. We want to finish the commitments that we have made so that our work can continue. Holy One, we give thanks for this opportunity to share ourselves and our gifts in the ministry of the kingdom of God. We give thanks for all that is good in the world, and we pray that we may lean into that goodness and do all the good that we can for all of our lives. And now bless the gifts that we have given to your service. Amen.
In just a moment, we're going to be singing the first verse of our closing hymn. And before we do that, we once again want to thank all of you for being here for worship today. We particularly thank all of our guests who are here. And we have something that we'd like to give you. Uh, Michael Dixon, one of our first friends. Michael, why don't you stand up for a moment? Michael is part of our first friends program here in the sanctuary. Michael has the magic red basket of gifts. And so at the end of the service, that's right, it is right there. At the end of the service, when Dr. Brewster goes to the back of the sanctuary, Michael is going to go to the back of the sanctuary as well. If you're a guest with us today, I invite you to uh, go say good morning to Michael. He'll be thrilled to meet you and to offer you a gift. Uh, our worship leaders are going to be going to uh, different exits so we all can say uh, good morning to you. Uh, Dr. Jania Garina Rodriguez and myself and Dr. Lamar Smith will be here down in the front of the sanctuary. If you'd like to come say good morning, if you would like to have prayer, we would be happy to do that with you. And with that in mind, let us now stand and raise our voices to God. Please be seated. Following uh, our benediction, I ask you to remain seated for the closing song from the 1111 band, uh, and then we'll be dismissed. Our gathering will soon be ended. Where will we go and what will we do? May grace, peace, hope, love, and joy forever accompany you. Amen.